So RMD really simply is required minimum distribution. Now, it's also known by its friend MRD, minimum required. I get clients who twist up all the words. It's like, well, we've got the words. Let's just use them in any order. But it means take money from your pre-tax account so that Uncle Sam can get a cut. Hi, my name is Annette Bao, your host of the Wealth Inside and Out podcast. I'm a certified financial planner and founder of The Millionaire Insider. For over 30 years, I have been advising and researching the top 1% of millionaires, and I am passionately obsessed with money, mindset, and the intersection of self-worth and net worth, and how the two connect and allow us to live fulfilled and wealthy lives on our terms. I'm a Midwestern girl who had a dream, began investing $25 a month 35 years ago, and today have a multi-million dollar net worth. I teach the tried and true that only someone with over three decades of experience advising millionaires would know. This podcast is different about much more than money. We talk about mindset, success, money blocks, worth barometer, and all aspects of money and topics from practical manifestation, along with real world how to and everything in between with the goal of making your journey easier and more fun. Think of this as coffee, actually matcha tea, learning real world common sense money and life advice from a BFF that you can start applying today. If you want to create a financially free life you love, you are in the right place, my friend. This is the Wealth Inside and Out podcast. So welcome to What is Required Minimum Distribution, also known as RMD. Sean Fitz is going to share some valuable insight on RMD, as well as how to make the most of your retirement planning, tax planning, and also your distributions you are required by law to take. So I'm so excited. So let's dive in. Today's free resource is our retirement plan checklist. You can go to themillionaireinsider.com forward slash RPC to access it. But you're going to love this free resource. It provides you an overview of the actions you need to take to avoid worrying about running out of money as well as to ensure you live your life and retirement on your terms. We share insight in this free retirement plan checklist resource that many people didn't even know or think about because we've been doing this for so long. So again, you can go to themillionaireinsider.com forward slash RPC. One of the most common concerns women have is becoming a bag lady, meaning running out of money, not having enough money to support themselves during retirement which often equates to either having to live with their kids, which for many of us is frightening, or being forced to get married, which is also equally frightening if you don't want to. This resource is going to show you how to create a plan so you can stop worrying about the what ifs. You can go to themillionaireinsider.com forward slash RPC to download this checklist, but you're going to love it. For today's show notes, you can go to themillionaireinsider.com forward slash 22. The information we provide is not intended to replace any investment, financial, tax, or any other advice. Before beginning, please consult with your own team of advisors and review your situation. You agree to hold millionaireseries.com, Annette Ba'u, and all affiliates harmless for information contained in these trainings. All international copyrights are reserved. So let's dive in. So welcome, everyone. I want to introduce you to Sean Fitz, one of the advisors that is certifying under me. So welcome, Sean. Hi, Annette. I am excited to be here today. I'm so excited to have you. So Sean and I have known each other for several years. I mean, Sean's just a good guy. Like I, one thing I will say about you, Sean, is you're a good guy. He's the kind of guy that if you needed something, you could rely on him. You just have that feeling. And so it's Thank such you, a good Annette. one. Yeah, well, it's true. And I, I've you know, known you long enough to just know kind of how you show up. And I think one of the things I just want to say, which is so awesome, and you might even have something to add to it, but you know, I knew Sean when he was actually thinking about getting out of the business. And I remember getting off that call and going, oh my gosh, you know, this is like, I've got to perform to help him perform so he doesn't get out of business. Because I thought his heart's in the right place. And you really have made a couple major shifts as far as everything, right? Do you want to just elaborate on that a little bit more before we dive into technical RMD? Certainly, Annette. Love what I do. Love serving people, but just made some changes and some tweaks to how we serve. 
you know, grew the business through reaching out to people in a more open manner and clients responded. They, uh, they stepped up and then we've grown since then. We've grown not just in clients, but we've grown a team as well. Well, and you've really made a shift. Like, you know, I think one of the things you talked about, because I have interviewed you before, but you talked a lot about like the internal shift you made. And I think this is applicable even for people who are looking at working with their finances is so much of success when it comes to money is our internal growth of getting that toddler limbic primal brain under control and starting to think through our prefrontal cortex. And when all of a sudden we can start shifting the focus on who we're serving and out there as compared to just in here and how we're feeling. I mean, that really helps. Do you, would you agree? It, it makes a huge difference and it, it makes a difference in how we respond to others as much as anything else, but responding to ourselves and being open with ourselves about things, but uh, being willing to change. That's a key part of life, being willing to grow. Yeah. Isn't that, and sometimes that's hard, right? <laughs> This is how I've always done it. I don't want to grow. <laughs> at, at any age, it's hard to do. <laughs> Amen. So Sean lives in North Carolina. He comes from a working class family. So his and my background is very similar. His dad was in the refrigerator business. My dad was in the plumbing business. So it's kind of interesting. He served our country, which to me is absolutely huge. He comes from you know very meager backgrounds. Not very much money, which I think in a lot of ways, those of us that didn't come from money have a very different perspective of money than people who do come from money. I think that's helpful when somebody's helping you from a standpoint of managing your money, you know, helping you to succeed financially. You know, he's just done some amazing things. I don't know if you want to add anything else. You were a mortgage lender, right? I did for 15 years. Yeah, for 15 years, he was a mortgage lender until he transitioned into the financial advisory business. And one of the things that I can remember when I first met him and he was considering not staying in the business was we had a conversation about the shift of, you know, mortgage is much more transactional, whereas success in financial advising is much more on a personal level. And I think one of the things that a lot of times people don't realize, and I mean, even companies is how important that personal connection is. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Sean, before we dive into it, our... It really is about relationships, making sure that people know how much you care, not how much you know. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Yeah. So in addition to being married for 32 years and having four children, I mean, I have three and I feel like I can't handle it. That's amazing. But the other thing that I think that's really awesome is the fact that you really prioritize your family. You know, you make decisions with your family and I I can so relate to that. It's just so important to understand the two. And I also think one of the things that I love is that you really realize that women are really underserved and you really started putting a lot of focus in on working with women. Very much so. We had some client experiences, especially around young widows People always think widows are, you know, 80-year-old grandma, and I'm talking about some 40-year-old women who had no idea what was going on with the money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's just cringeworthy, right? You know, it's kind of like, you know, oh, I hope it's going well. So today we're talking about a topic that can be overwhelming for some people, but it's a question I hear all the time. It's like, what is RMD? And I find it fascinating that even this far into my journey, <clears throat> doing this for 34 years, almost 35 years, I still have clients saying, now what's RMD? I'm like, okay, you've been taking it for 20 years. By now you should know what RMD is. But I think it's just something where people know they've got to do it. They know it's something that has to do with the government, but oftentimes they're really confused about it. So Today, we're going to dispel all of those questions and all the mystery behind it. And Sean is the perfect guy to do that. So let's just start out with the basics. Some of you may already know this, but for some people who don't, let's start with what is RMD? What does it stand for? And what does it mean? That's a great question, Annette. And and I still get it routinely from people (laughs) who have been taking them like, what is this again? So RMD really simply is required minimum distribution. Now, It's also known by its friend, MRD, minimum required. I get clients who twist up all the words. It's like, well, we've got the words. Let's just use them in any order. But it means take money from your pre-tax account so that Uncle Sam can get a cut. So when you say pre-tax, can you explain that to people? Oh, definitely. 
Most people have used either some form of IRA, 401k, TSP, 403b, any one of those tax acronyms that means they put money into retirement savings that has never been taxed. And now it's time to take the money out, which is where the required minimum distribution comes into play. It is age driven and they changed it again just this year. Used to be 70 and a half was a magic number. And who came up with the half? Are we toddlers? <laughs> so, you know, then they went to 72 and it was 72 for about three years. And now it's 73. And in 10 more years or so, it's going to go to 74, 75. So we'll keep getting great questions about when am I supposed to do this? But at the end of the day, Uncle Sam has said, if you're not taking at least some money from this account, there is a minimum calculation we've got that says, we want you to take some money from your retirement account every year, again, so that we can tax it because we've never gotten any tax money off those funds. Well, it's funny you say that about 70 and a half, because I remember <clears throat> I was at a lecture and this guy was a tax attorney. And he said they had done a lot of research on how they came up with the rules and what they could determine is it basically depended on who was, you know, in Congress, because it was like earmark what benefited the people voting on it. And I thought how terrifying, but it was like, okay, so somebody didn't want to have to take it because they were 70. And they thought, okay, if we can push it to 70 and a half, I can wait another year. And I thought that was so funny. And I'm like, oh, God, that's just I would have never thought of that. So anyway, I thought that was kind of funny. But so it used to be 70 and a half, like April 15th, following your 70 and a half birthday. And then it was 72. And now it's actually when you become 73. So if you become Correct. 70, if you're 73, January 1st, you've got to take it for that year. You do still have the ability to wait until April 1st of the following year. But then do you have to take two? You would have to see there's there's always a trick to it. They, they've thought that through. <laughs> yes, you would. You would have to take two. And you know, there are circumstances where that would benefit someone. I, I literally had someone last year who worked half a year, then retired, and he was of age. But because of what he had earned last year versus what he would earn this year, which was no working income oh. and cons consulting, we chose to defer it and he would take two this year. Okay. And it worked well in his favor. Yeah. And I think that's a great point. And that's really why you need an advisor to look at it, make sure that that is the right thing to do. You know, it's interesting because I have heard so many people say, oh, I don't have to take it until next year. But a lot of them don't realize they have to take two. And I think those are the little details that, you know, a lot of times people don't know. And the most important thing you walk away from this conversation is that you've got to make sure you know all the details and what the current laws are, because there's probably not a lot of forgiveness, right? If you mess those up. <laughs> well, Uncle Sam's not real worried about it. They've got some guidelines in place to help you. If you take too much or too little, they're just going to take more taxes. You know, if you think about it, if you take two in one year, that just means they sort of doubled up on how much tax revenue they were going to get that year from you. Well, what happens <clears throat> if somebody doesn't take it and they, they're supposed to? That is a fair question. Now, oddly enough, and I was surprised Congress changed that rule this year as well. And it went from 50% penalty before, which I personally thought was a bit egregious. Now it's 25% of what you should have taken. So if you were supposed to take $10,000 and you didn't take any, now you'd have a penalty of $2,500. However, they had a little forgiveness in there and said, if you forgot and you fix it really quickly, we'll only charge you a 10% penalty. Isn't that generous? <laughs> well, and I'll say this much. And again, I am not a tax attorney. I'm not a CPA. But I will say this much. I have over the course of my career, namely because of my CPA sharing with me, and, and I've had a couple clients where they thought they took something and they didn't. And, you know, some of the ones where it's like, you've done it for like 30 or 40 years, like, oh yeah, I took it. And then you're like, okay, you said you took it. And it's like, wait a minute, I'm not adding up these numbers. And interestingly enough, and I don't know now with the new law, if they're going to change it, but when it was 50%, I know they were a little more flexible. Like if it was your first error, there was a lot more likelihood that you'd be forgiven. Now, Again, I am not recommending that you forget, but I do know in the past they've been a little forgiving. Do you have any insight on that? 
I have seen where they've offered waivers at various times, but it's pretty rare. And the likelihood with the new change is they're trying to eliminate even having to have that conversation by saying, yeah. look, we'll drop it to 10 if you just act on it pretty quick. I I think you're going to get bit yeah, if you yeah, do yeah. not stay on top of it. Yeah, especially now because it's kind of it's only 10 percent. When it was 50 percent, it was yeah. like, I mean, I'm like, oh, my God, this is a problem. Yes, brutal. I will say there is a reason that someone might not take it even at the risk of a 10% or 25% penalty is if it's a really, really, really down market and they think the account can recover, that could be a strategic move to not take it and let the money recoup before you take some money out. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, those are all considerations. And I just think the one thing I would leave with is you need to consult with a qualified advisor, meaning these are things that you just don't want to mess around with. And it's one of the things where, you know, if you are spending, you know, the hours needed to make sure you're up on everything and you look at the pros and cons of each situation and you then feel comfortable making the decision, great. For most people, myself included, you know, that it's just a lot because it's there's just a lot of moving parts and it seems like it continues to change and it's hard to stay up on all of those rules. I would agree. And one last caveat would always be obviously consult with your tax professional as well before you make a strategic move like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great advice. So you kind of answered this, but just give us another view. So why is it that they require you to take minimum distribution at that age versus letting you defer it and then pass it on, say, to your heirs? It's a great question. We hear it a lot. I don't need the money. My pension is enough. My social security is enough. I've got other money, whatever. And there are plenty of people that just don't need it at all. And at the end of the day, Congress inside the IRS code has put together these rules that say, look, we're going to let you save some money and defer the taxes on it for decades, literally decades. You think about you start putting money in your 401k at 20 years old. Mm -hmm getting a little match action and it's growing and it's growing and it's growing. Nobody's ever paid taxes on that money. And Uncle Sam needs to get a piece of that pie so that they can pay for all the fun things out there. Like reading in the news lately, they're going to need some money because we've got some problems coming up, right? They do. They do. And, and, uh, and, and of course, literally at the end of the day, taxation is the way the country's funded for its major things, whatever you know we need for federal government purposes. And so this is just one of those buckets that they take some tax money from. And, and so it's a little bit of paying your fair share to some degree because you've never paid taxes on this money at all. It's It's been sitting tax deferred for you know years and years and years, and it's just time they've got to eventually get taxes on it. Mm-hmm. And, and we'll touch on what does it mean for your heirs because most people do die with some money left over in that bucket, and that's a little different than we'll touch on. Yeah, let's touch on that for a second. So Let's just say, you know, somebody dies, they have X amount of money left in their, you know, IRA. Most people would be an IRA. Some, it would be other accounts, but an IRA. And I mean, what happens if they're leaving that to their spouse or if they leave it to the children? What are those rules? That's really good because that is complex. Uh, Spouses get the best treatment. You know, they have an opportunity to roll it into their own account and, and continue to extend either the deferment or drag out how long they take the money out. They they have the most beneficial rules for spouses because Congress recognizes we want to protect spouses to some degree and not bankrupt them, so to speak. But one of the things that was recognized in 2019 changes that came out starting in someone dies in 2020 and now is that if you're a non-spouse inheritor or beneficiary, that Uncle Sam says, listen, uh, this was not intended for you to stretch out for another 30 or 40 years. This was not funds for you. It was for the person before. And we want you to take the money out uh, a lot quicker. So there are some 10-year rules. There are some current rules. There are some five-year rules. There's a mix of rules that come into play depending on various age of the person, age of the person that died. Generically speaking, you've got 10 years to get the money out. 
That's kind of what Congress is after. So, so the wife has her lifetime. Wife has her lifetime. Yes. And that one's the most flexible. And then 10 year is normal. And interestingly enough, that's what it used to be for trusts. And that's the reason a lot of people would leave it to their kids and not a trust is because a trust forced it to be 10 years. But now right. it's 10 years, whether it's a trust or it's your children. When is it five years? There's a slight rule of depending on when you got it, if you don't take any distributions at all, you would have to take it all out in five years as a trust would. Trust now is five years. Oh, okay. But repeat that again. So non, when is it five years? Sorry. I didn't catch that. Can you say that again? When it is a non I'm going to use the word human beneficiary okay. Okay. is the main is the main component for five okay. years. Okay, gotcha. Okay, okay, gotcha. That's good to know. I'm learning stuff here too. Now there so, is some yeah. there is a tweak that is being debated still from the IRS. Do you have to take some distribution during the 10 years, just have it empty by the 10th year? And yeah. that has recently come up that is not clear yet. Mm-hmm. Well, and there's some, I mean, I was just at a tax planning workshop where that topic came up and they were saying, yeah, you just have to take it out within 10 years. That was their argument. And so it was like, they were thinking, we'll just wait until 10 years and then the 10th year, take it all out. It's like, that would be something you'd want clarified. (laughs) It's going to need to be clarified. And and like I said, I've read mixed information because I really do emphasize tax planning in our business model. And I've read very mixed information, even in the last week or two, as I was looking up different information for clients. Now, there's one huge exception that we haven't touched on, and that's if it's a Roth IRA or Roth 401k, which was recently amended as well in 2022. Since there's never been a required minimum distribution inside that, you can certainly let it grow for the whole 10 years and then take it all out in one lump sum because it's not going to be taxed either. But now do you have to take it out? So if it's you inherited. You do have to take it out at the end of the 10 years. Right, if right. It's if it's inherited. 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 Okay. Sorry, we were, I, I was still in the inherited. Mm-hmm. Okay, flow. no. I mean, there's just a lot of moving parts, right? Is there any situation where somebody can avoid RMD? There are always exceptions to the rule, right? <laughs> Isn't that really Yay, where that's you're what looking we want, for? An exceptions exception to the rule. and little cheat sheets. And <laughs> currently, the only way someone can, I think the word avoid might be a misnomer. They can continue to defer that RMD past this age 73. If you're still working full time, it's your money. You're still working full time at a company that you own less than 5% of the company. Oh, interesting. Wow. So if you're the big owner or somebody too bad, you're still going to have to take your RMD at 73 now. But if you just work there, you're just, you know, Joe Susie worker and you're still in the 401k and you're 75 years old, you do not have to take an RMD yet. You can can continue to push that monkey down the road. And that's if you're full-time? I believe that it is full-time, yes. Yeah, that would make sense. But again, these are all things that if you're considering that, you always have to check with an advisor because things change. And so it might be full-time now, then it changes to part-time. You just want to know the facts. So once you take your RMD, obviously, if you need the money, you're going to spend it. But what if you don't need it? What what do people typically do with their RMD? Probably most people spend it, right? (laughs) (laughs) I love it. And, And I get a great mix of that. You know, it's the first of the year. We're talking to people about what are they going to do with their RMD this year? When do they want to take it already? We're having those conversations. And we've gotten uh, Disney trips that are talked about. (laughs) We've gotten uh, three season rooms that need to be finished. (laughs) And then we have a few people who go, no, just transfer the money over to my other account and let's keep it working because I just don't need it right now. And, And so we just we pay the taxes and the difference goes to, you know, whatever kind of thing is on their mind. Well, and I think going to Disneyland, you really need your entire RMD. It is so expensive. I, <laughs> from the time my children were little, now granted my kids are now in college, but from the time they were little to when they were in like their junior, senior year where their some group went over to Disneyland. And I remember thinking like, it is like so expensive. How are these families? Because you could look at these families and go, they have been saving this for an entire year. And I think it's like things have gotten so expensive that, you know, it's, Sometimes it's hard to be able to save that money, even though that's that's really the ideal thing to do. 
if you don't need the money, right? It is. It's good. But, you know, I think what's been really nice is to hear grandparents, because we're talking about people, RMDs, we're talking about people in their 70s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so what we are seeing is they're going, you know what? I'm going to spend this on a family trip and we're going to take all the kids and grandkids and go do whatever it is that they're thinking about. And Mm -hmm. what they're doing is they're creating memories. Yes. It it was never about the money anyway. It's about let's create some more memories. Let's enjoy some family time. Let's take some pictures Mm -hmm. and just have a, yeah, no. And I think that's huge. As long as you're okay financially, I think something like that is ideal. And you know, I mean, there's a whole concept of, you know, giving some of the money to your kids while you're living so you can see them enjoying it or grandkids as compared to waiting until you die. And I think it also, you can also see which ones you should probably put some provisions in your trust on so they don't get a lot of money because like they get it and it's gone. You know, I have one child that's so aware of money and I have another one that just thinks, you know, our money is his money. And it's just fascinating how they were raised with the same values. It's just fascinating how it's you... usually the younger they get, the more entitled they feel. I don't know. Well, mine's but... actually the opposite. Oh, the older okay. son who is, this is how it is. And this is what we should do with our money, which means giving him a lot of it. And it's like, no, this is our money. You're yeah, a right. college student. So let's get that. <laughs> let's get that real clear. I right? love that. That's fantastic. But yeah. It's just fascinating though to watch. Okay. So let's talk about if you have multiple IRAs, you know, sometimes <clears> people have, or even let's talk about like, I have a situation right now with a client who has so many different accounts. They have a 403B, they've got a 401K. These are from previous employers, they've got an IRA, they've got a SEP IRA, and they've got a Roth IRA. I'm like, oh my gosh, like, it's no wonder you can't remember all your assets. What do you recommend when a person's in a situation like that? Yes, there are some rare instances where someone might keep some separate accounts. And one of the rarest of them, and probably maybe the only reason to do it is here in North Carolina, we have a, what's called a Bailey Act for people that worked prior to a certain date for the state. If their money's still in the state 401k, 403bs, they don't pay state income taxes on those dollars. Oh. And so that's a type of exception where I could see someone saying, no, I, I need to keep those money separate. And I've got my other IRA and other things from other places, but that money I'll never get, I'll never pay state income taxes on. Wow. Aside from that rarity of where it would be a special maybe taxation situation, you do complicate it because a 401k must have its own RMD. A 403b has got to have its own RMD. An IRA, of course, must have its own RMD. And you do create where you must take an RMD from each of those accounts versus, oh, I have four IRAs because I accumulated them at different times at different places. And then you can choose to take all your RMD from one IRA, mm-hmm. or you can take a partial from each. You know, you can mix and match and have more choice. But if you have it with the multiple types of retirement accounts, then you're going to have to take one from each and you have to track that. The IRS is watching that. You're going to get a notice. Somebody's telling. Yeah. Well, and one of the things mm-hmm. that we do when the person has a lot for various reasons, like sometimes it just They have to, like you say, there's various reasons. And what we always do is just make sure that the CPA also confirms the numbers, because especially when it was a 50% penalty, the risk of that is so great. You know, you don't want to be messing around. And now, again, you have to check with your own advisor, but I would pretty much guarantee that now that they've reduced the penalty, they're going to be a lot less lenient than they have in the past. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> they're, they're definitely like, Sorry. It's, a, it's a done deal now. Mm-hmm. You, you're going to get slapped one way or the other because mm-hmm. we're going to get some extra money out of it. We're, yeah, we're, we yeah, don't have yeah, to play yeah. the game. Yeah, yeah. We're going to get some extra money out of it. Oh, this has been so helpful. Boy, I feel like I have gotten a PhD in RMDs. So is there anything else that you'd like to share with our listeners or anything along those lines? I think the biggest thing for most people is to, one, Get a handle on where your money is and and what it's doing. I'm not saying everyone should consolidate or, you know, that depends on each person's situation and what's appropriate for them. However, I can say if you don't 
keep meticulous track, it, you can lose track of some money. I, I, I had a client several years ago call me up. He, he'd been a client for four or five years, calls me up. Hey, I found $75,000. I forgot about it in old 401k. It's like, how did you forget that? <laughs> well, I mean, like 20 years ago, there was 7 trillion unclaimed. And the only reason it was yeah. only 7 trillion is every seven years, it reverts back to the state. There is so much money unclaimed. And if you can't remember it, your heirs are not going to. And now that we're so electronic, you know, right. people aren't getting paper statements. So somebody yeah. dies, you'll never know about it. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't realize why it's so important to have a financial plan and really know where your assets are. I have one more question. Just because I'm sure some people on the call are saying, you talked about a Roth, you talked about an IRA. What is the difference between a Roth IRA and an IRA? I love it. That's a common question, and I'll make it pretty easy. An IRA is sort of like if you're going to plant an apple tree, and as the apples come off of it, Uncle Sam gets to come in and take a bite of every apple you pull <laughs> off that tree. That's a regular IRA. <laughs> A Roth IRA, he's taking a little bite off the seed, but you get all the apples on it all to yourself. So that's really the way I kind of show the two differences. So if I understand correctly, so with an IRA, then basically they've not paid tax on that money and it's gone right. and started growing. And then when they start taking it, they pay tax. But with a Roth, they've already paid tax on the money that they're funding it with. That's right. Yeah. So that's the seed. Oh, that's a good analogy. Yes. All right. Well, this has been such a wealth of information. So I want to say, if you want to learn more about Sean, go to the millionaire insider.com forward slash Sean Fitz, S E A N F I T T S. And if you want some specific help or you have questions relating to your RMD or some other financial matter, go to the millionaire insider.com forward slash support hyphen request. I'm so thankful that you have shared this. And I think you have dispelled a lot of questions and even answered some that I was not aware of. So I want to thank you so much for your insight. This has been just a wealth of information. Love it, Annette. Love being a resource and love working with you. You do such a fantastic job. Well, thank you. I think I do such a fantastic job because I surround myself by really smart people. People are always like come to me. I'm like, go check with one of my advisors. They are <laughs> they're so smart. But anyway, it's great to it's great to know you on a personal level and to just know how much you really do truly care, not only about your family, but about your clients. And you know, that's something that I just think in our financial services industry is so needed because it's so easy to say, yeah, I really care about you. But from a perspective of I'm more concerned about myself and my own agenda. And I don't ever get that feeling from you or really any of my advisors. And so I want to just tell you, I really do appreciate that. Thank you. So there you have it. Wasn't that great? Learned so much about what is an RMD, who has to take one, the different ages. I mean, now it's gone up to 73 when you can avoid it, what the situation is, which is not very often, and what to do if you have multiple accounts. So we've got, you know, the scenario where even though now the penalties last down to 10%, you still have to really look and make sure that you are looking strategically at what makes sense based on your situation, based on what how much your income is going to be each year, if you should wait and take two out instead of one, all those things that really do require some analysis. We talked about the difference between an IRA and a Roth IRA, which is really important. And then what to do if you have kind of a mess where you have just a ton of accounts. If you love the content of this podcast, please follow and subscribe to our channel so you get notified of episodes and also give us a five-star review and share a comment. We really appreciate it. Congratulations on taking another step to create a financially free life you love. If you're not sure about your financial future or that it's in order or you are ready to stop worrying about money or possibly the fear of becoming a bag lady, ending up broke in retirement, or you simply are ready to know your financial house is in order so that you can have a bright financial future, please go to themillionaireinsider.com forward slash NSF. And that doesn't stand for non-sufficient funds. It stands for next step finance. It's the next best step of what you need to do so you can avoid an NSF notice in your future. Again, themillionaireinsider.com forward slash NSF. The number of women who were not broke or poor while working or married is staggering. 
The entire mission of the Wealth Inside and Out podcast is to ensure you have the information for you, your family, your friends, anyone who's willing to listen to it and apply it so that you can create a financially free life you love. Again, themillionaireinsider.com forward slash NSF. Until our next episode, take one action that will help you create a financially free life you love. I'm Annette Ba'u, your host. All international copyrights are reserved. Bye for now.